distinguished um, chiefs of Navy, um, INS members, and the Secretariat. Um, colleagues, um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the INS and um, also the Power Center, Mr. Andrew Forbes, for my participation in the excellent arrangement for this um, um, symposium. It's also um, good to see a number of familiar faces um, in the symposium. So my task um, for this afternoon is to look at the economic importance of um, fisheries. Um, in the Indian Ocean um, region. So we all know how uh, the Navy and also our Coast Guard and um, more and more the police have um, significant but often only a supplemental role in the conservation of fisheries resources. Um, so what, however, I'd like to highlight in this presentation um, that the increasing pressure on fisheries resources, um, that there are more um, impact not only in sustainability but also in regional security that requires a more strategic role um, for our navies. Um, so the presentation will be of um, four points. One, um, we'll be looking at the economic and conservation significance of uh, fisheries in the Indian Ocean. And um, unlike uh, Dr. Ghosh, I would have to nauseate you with some of the statistics. I certainly got um, nauseous, you know, trying to extract some of the statistics or some of the information from various sources. Um, particularly looking at the patterns of production um, and trade, as these would relate to the economic viability and economic significance of fisheries in the region. Um, the second would be looking at the key issues and challenges confronting um, the Indian Ocean region with respect to the sustainability and also the regional security of our fisheries resources. The third part looks at the commitments of the sub-regional and the regional fisheries organizations or the organizational uh, structure in addressing um, some of these fisheries issues. And lastly will be um, more so a view of how we can turn some of the challenges into opportunities and potential um, for the Indian Ocean. So in terms of fisheries access, there are a number of countries, um, more than 30 countries involved in accessing fisheries resources in the Indian Ocean, and that would include the coastal states and also the distant water fishing nations um, in the area. Um, it involves countries with diverse economies, diverse cultures, and also fishing practices. So the fishing economy in the Indian Ocean region is as diverse as the culture of its people. Now the fisheries comprise a complex mix of your inshore fisheries, artisanal fisheries, um, small-scale fisheries, commercial, offshore, industrial fisheries, recreational fisheries, um, and also aquaculture to supplement um, the sometimes declining um, marine capture um, production. So every single country in the Indian Ocean would have a different characterization of each of these um, fisheries um, sector. So what might be traditional um, fishery to one country might actually be a commercial fishery to another. Um, fisheries contributes, as we know, to food security and also to poverty alleviation and also economic development. And this is where some of the statistics would, you know, um, come in. Um, in terms of um, the animal um, protein intake um, contribution of um, fish, it's up to 50% in some of the Indian Ocean countries such as um, Mozambique. Um, in terms of per capita, um, consumption, some of the Indian Ocean countries would have a per capita consumption of fish of about 10 to 20 kilograms a year, but for countries such as Seychelles, it's up to 75 kilos a year. So that's a relatively high per capita consumption. Now there's a range of commercially valuable species for the region, ranging from your pelagic fish or the fish that thrives in the water column to the demersal fish that live or um, that live or feed um, closer to the bottom of the ocean, and also your crustaceans. So we have a range of tuna and tuna-like species: your swordfish, your mackerel, sardines, um, and also your shrimps and um, lobsters. And they're all commercially valuable um, for the region. So the fisheries 
um, contribute not only to the employment, the livelihood of the people, um, especially with the downstream industries or the processing plants that we have um, you know, in our ports, um, but also it's a good source of foreign income and we'll see that in some of the trade flows um, for fisheries in the region. And also has a high contribution on GDP in some countries. Um, so in most um, Indian Ocean countries, the contribution of fish to the GDP is only one to two percent. But for um, some countries, say such as um, Tanzania, it's about you know five percent. In some areas of Tanzania, it's up to ten percent contribution to the GDP. So it's quite um, significant. Um, so as we can imagine, because of the complexity of the fisheries in the Indian Ocean, we can expect that there are different legal regimes that apply um, in um, the domestic jurisdiction. So some countries such as Australia would have um, more established rights-based management of fisheries, whereas others would subscribe to an open access um, management system. So in terms of fishery statistics or collection of fisheries data, um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has divided the Indian Ocean into three um, areas. We have the Western Indian Ocean, the Eastern Indian Ocean, and the Antarctic and Southern um, Indian Ocean. So each of the regions would have a different marine environment and therefore would have different um, fisheries productivity. Um, the northwestern Indian Ocean, for example, and the Gulf and the Oman Sea would have a lower productivity compared to other areas of the um, Indian Ocean. Okay, so now I'd like to draw your attention um, to the time series data on fish production. Um, I'm sorry if it's not very clear from where you're um, sitting. As, um, I, I was quite happy that I was able to generate this graph early this morning. I've try, been trying to do so for the past few days, but have been unsuccessful. But I'll um, sort of take you through it. Um, um, the blue line um, is the fish production for the eastern um, Indian Ocean. And you can see that uh, fish production in the Indian Ocean has significantly increased um, over um, decades, and in fact, um, the increase is, I think, a little less than 20% from 2007, and it's still moving upward. So there's still um, um, a big uh, fisheries production in the Eastern Indian Ocean. Compare that with the green line, which is uh, probably what you cannot um, see clearly in this graph. The green line is the fish production for the Western Indian Ocean. And you'd see that in the last 10 years, um, that fisheries production has actually tapered off. So there have been studies uh, suggesting that about 30% of um, the fish stocks in the Western Indian Ocean um, is actually overexploited, and about 65% would be fully exploited. So that probably suggests that um, you know, fisheries in the Western Indian Ocean would, is actually in its full capacity. Um, and the red line is for the Antarctic, um, the fisheries production for the Antarctic um, Indian Ocean. Oh, so this is a clearer graph on the catch of the Indian Ocean, but I'd like to just um, draw your attention to the catch of the Indian, um, Eastern Indian Ocean, particularly that black um, shade, where it talks about the catch composition. So we all know that there is a continuous increase in fisheries production in the Eastern Indian Ocean, but you'd notice that in terms of catch composition, um, most of the catch, almost 50% of the catch, are categorized as other species not elsewhere indicated. So in fact, they you know, lumped all the other species together because there's not enough stock assessment to determine the status of the stocks. And that unfortunately impacts on our decision making. In terms of commercially uh, valuable species such as tuna, um, these data is taken from uh, the Indian Ocean um, Tuna Commission um, website. So it shows us that there has been an increasing catch of tuna resources and then again from around 2005, 2006, um, that catch has declined, um, which is not necessarily a bad sign. Um, it's primarily because the IOTC has established a good management um, regime for tuna resources um, in the region. 
So most of um, the tuna stuffs that were fished in the IOTC, uh, um, uh, southern bluefin, you have the skipjack, the uh, uh, big eye tuna, the yellowfin, and also swordfish. Um, this table is just an indication of, you know, catch in the northern, um, northwestern Indian Ocean. As I said, it's characterized by low productivity, but the main actors here would be Iran and um, Oman. In terms of aquaculture production, which supplements or marine capture production, in South Asian countries alone, the contribution of aquaculture is six million tons of fish worth $12 billion. And that's for South Asian countries alone. And that is about 8% of the world cap, um, aquaculture capture, uh, aquaculture production. Yeah, I suppose this is another um, table that you might not be able to see, but it's, it's good to have a comparison of the regional trade, comparing Indian Ocean um, countries with other regions such as the Pacific and Africa in general, and also Southeast Asia and East Asia. So what um, this, these tables only suggest is that um, Indian Ocean countries are high net exporters of fish. So they don't import as much as they export, um, which is not the same with Southeast um, Asian countries. And if you look at the figures, um, the export value for the Indian Ocean is $19 billion. Um, dollars. Um, so that's quite a substantial um, foreign um, earning um, from fish. And it's not doing too bad compared to um, the fish trade flows in the Pacific and also Africa in general. So there's a lot of potential here for the Indian Ocean region. And you can have a similar analysis going down to the individual country level. So if you look at India, for example, which is um, they've just made an example of one country, um, of several countries, but focusing on India in particular, the fish exports um, export value is $3 billion. So India... Um, earns $3 billion from exporting its fish. Now, you, we can compare that with Thailand, which is a major competitor um, in fish trade, but also a part of the Indian Ocean, um, where, India, um, where Thailand exports about $2.8 billion of, um, of fish commodities, but it's also importing about the same amount of fish, whereas with India, you've got, you have $3.2 billion of fish export earning, and you're only importing about $68 million. Um, so here we can look at the interplay of um, fisheries trade between um, countries, and my suggest, it might suggest that um, the Indian Ocean can benefit for a little bit of in intra-trade, trade within the region, as opposed to trading um, inter regional trade or trading outside um, the region. So these are some of the, you know, the economic benefits that you'd highlight, just looking at the statistics on fisheries. Um, this slide is more on the global um, vessel size and distribution. It's not specific to the Indian Ocean um, countries, but uh, we can make a, um, um, a conclusion that the global vessel uh, size or the size of the vessels, particularly in the Indian Ocean, represents you know, the global vessel size where there is more small vessels than the large vessels. And this has an implication on our management um, systems where there's less of a licensing and registration regime for small vessels. And small vessels, we mean you know, those vessels um, less than 24 meters LOA or less than 12 meters um, LOA and these are vessels are involved uh, mostly in our medium scale and small scale fisheries. So after having um, discussed you know, the fisheries resources that we need to protect in the region, we can now discuss some of the fisheries related challenges in the region. And you can actually um, classify these challenges into four. 
one challenge relates to the resource itself. Um, and that includes, you know, inadequate stock assessment, poor data collection, overfishing, um, occurrences of or um, existence of illegal, um, unregulated and unreported fishing. Um, the second set of challenges can relate to the marine environment itself, you know, the, the impact of pollution and fisheries and vice versa, you know, habitat destruction as a result of and resulting from um, fisheries. Um, natural disasters, you know, impact of climate change on fisheries. The third set of challenges relate to trade, and this is mainly on the lack of infrastructure and lack of capacity of most Indian Ocean countries to um, promote the quality of their fish. Um, and this prevents Indian Ocean countries from, um, especially those belong to the small scale um, fisheries, to um, promote their um, uh, fish commodities to the international market. And last look, um, and the last set of challenges relate to the legal management and policy framework where there are certain gaps in our domestic legal um, framework, but th there's also a lack of a comprehensive uh, approach to fisheries management and also an increasing international regulation on fish trade and IAU fishing, which most um, exporting countries would have to face. Um, as an example, um, the European Union and also the United States um, have established very rigorous or strict regulations on IAU fishing in that they list not just IAU vessels, but they also list what they call a non-cooperating state. And they have made a list of um, non-cooperating states or states with vessels conducting illegal fishing and the government not having done anything to rectify the situation. Um, a lot of, uh, a number of Caribbean and Latin American countries are on the list of non-cooperating states, and for the Indian Ocean, there's only one country that's up on the list. There's also an increasing emergence of um, fisheries issues that don't uh, only have an impact on sustainability, but have um, uh, more of a, a regional security impact. Um, and we can highlight a few um, things. I was talking to a distinguished gentleman um, over tea break, and um, it's good to hear that some of these issues are actually raised, you know, in a, um, in a naval forum. One is the use of fishing vessels for acts of terrorism or other criminal activities such as smuggling of um, people, um, trafficking of narcotics, um, and also piracy. So we've talked about the um, piracy in Somalia, and this would be one good example of this type of um, um, issue. So we all know how um, resource challenges have um, contributed to some of the Somali fishermen being involved in um, piratical attacks, but there are also reports in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission indicating that there are sustainability issues as a result of these piracy attacks. And these relate to the relocation of the fishing catch and effort where, you know, distant water fishing nations in the Indian Ocean region used to fish in, um, off the basin of um, Somalia have now started fishing for something else, mainly albacore tuna and yellowfin tuna. And that has increased the pressure for these resources. Um, another example that they've cited is the fishing vessels coming or being flagged by Iran. So apparently, Iranian f fishing fleet has fished um, in the adjacent waters off the coast of um, the, the Somali basin, um, and now they've moved back to the Iranian exclusive economic zone to fish for longtail and um, yellowfin tuna, and that has increased pressure on these resources. Another um, Fisheries issue is the involvement of organized criminal groups in illegal fishing, particularly on high value, low volume species. So for Australia, this includes abalone and rock lobster. And as a result, most of the states in Australia have um, modified or amended their fishery, fisheries legislation to include um, what we call trafficking in fish. 
The third is the alleged harassment of fishing vessels by naval ve vessels, particularly in contested areas or in areas with undelimited maritime boundaries. So this is more, um, there are more cases or incidents up in East Asia and also in South China Sea, but there are also isolated cases in the Indian Ocean and unconfirmed reports where fishing vessels have allegedly been harassed by naval vessels. Um, and these are some of the issues with um, no specific or no um, um, comprehensive international legal or regional framework that may be discussed in um, IONS or um, some other um, forum. So the Indian Ocean in terms of regional fisheries policy and management or, you know, at, at re as, as a as uh, fisheries management structure if, or architecture, if you may, is divided into you know, different regional organizations. Um, and these organizations have scientific um, functions, policy functions, and the management um, functions. Um, and in this slide, it just tells us that um, uh, basically each of this organization has a different area of competence and species coverage, and sometimes they overlap, and they have different memberships. But there is no single meeting, forum, or discussion that um, involves a, a discussion of all of these transboundary issues, or there is really no attempt to harmonize some of uh, the similar policies in the region. The IOTC is an important um, regional fisheries management organization for the Indian Ocean, um, not only because it provides a management regime for the commercial for a commercially valuable species, but it also promotes or uh, provides us with a stock assessment, which helps us with the management decisions. Um, more than that, and this would be more interesting for the Navy, is that it has established a monitoring control and surveillance sy system and a compliance mechanism um, to monitor the activities of the vessels. And there's now a discussion of a future development in the IOTC which involves the establishment of a high seas boarding and inspection regime, similar to that of the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. So these are some of the species covered under the IOTC. Um, most of the species are healthy stocks, um, but you can, uh, we can, um, ex except for the striped marlin, which is overfished and is still being subject to overfishing. The other species that we've discussed in relation to piracy in Somalia are albacore tuna and long-tailed tuna. And the increase in um, fishing pressure in these resources have resulted in these resources being subject to overfishing. They're not overfished yet, but they are being subject to overfishing. Um, uh, just on the last point on IOTC, just to give us an appreciation of how many vessels we need to monitor in the Indian Ocean region, there are more than 5,000 vessels fishing for tuna and tuna resources in the Indian Ocean. So that's a lot of vessels to monitor in the area. So as C said, there are a, a number of limitations um, for these regional organizations. Um, primarily, you know, these regional organizations only address fisheries conservation and management and cannot address or they, they do not have the jurisdiction or capacity to address transnational crime in fisheries. I would also like to suggest that, you know, the involvement of the Navy is currently underdeveloped in terms of regional fisheries compliance. So now turning some of these challenges into opportunities, there are certainly lots, a number of opportunities and um, potential for the um, uh, Indian Ocean is specifically with respect to um, fisheries. You know, even though um, some of the resources are subject to overfishing, um, the fact is most of the commercially valuable stocks are not overfished. And even for those that are subject to overfishing, there is um, time and opportunity for these um, uh, fish stocks to recover. 
there's also a lot of regional trade advantage um, such as you know being um, the IO uh, Indian Ocean countries being um, net exporters of fish so can you can elicit a lot of um, um, regional fish trade um, within the region and also outside um, in the regional markets such as the EU and the US. The third opportunity is the increasing access of coastal state to the resources in the region. So for the longest time, distant water fishing nations have fished in the Indian Ocean um, um, fishing area, but statistics would suggest that their catch um, have been declining and their participation in, um, um, in regional fisheries access um, have been declining, whereas the coastal state or the fishing access or the fisheries production of the coastal states within the Indian Ocean um, has been increasing. And this is a welcoming development in that um, there is a potential for increased management in the region if you're only involving um, countries within the Indian Ocean, and there's also potential to control the illegal fishing activities of distant water fishing nations. Um, the fourth is the growing awareness on the relationship between illegal fishing and transnational crime. And even though we've mentioned that there is um, no regional framework or international framework to address this um, particular problem, there is um, an opportunity to discuss this in different um, regional security forum. And also the MCS development. So every single country recognizes MCS as, an, um, as a principle in effective fisheries management and also um, to address um, illegal fishing. And there is now a move towards regulating high seas fisheries, which would require the involvement of the Navy. So the last set of sets of opportunities relates to strengthening regional um, participation and regional cooperation in the Indian Ocean, whether it be a better coordination management system between the sub-regional um, fisheries organizations or the involvement of key actors such as, for example, I, uh, I highlight um, South Africa. Um, South Africa in terms of fisheries access has a limited participation in the Indian Ocean, but it has a lot to offer in terms of um, um, the way it manages its fisheries resources and also its participation in a regional forum. SADC, for example, the Southern African Development Community is an economic community, but it has adopted a protocol in fisheries. So I wonder if it's a similar um, a structure can be devo developed for fisheries within a regional or economic security forum. Um, the last is, uh, um, as I said, a more sort of regional discussion of fisheries issues um, within a broader context of economic and regional security fora. And I understand that the IORA has been trying to um, discuss environmental and fisheries related um, matters um, in its forum. But I also wonder if you know some of these issues can be picked up by either the proposed INS working party or um, or even in the track two and a suggested track two within the Indian Ocean um, region. There's a lot of bilateral cooperation between um, navies and coast guards addressing illegal fishing and also the multilateral hot pursuit, say in the Southern Ocean. But there is a lot of scope still for the multilateral approach to addressing some of even some of the key issues in fisheries that have both a sustainability and regional security impact. And I couldn't think of anything um, else apart from the INS to have a you know, better forum to discuss the potential of some of these opportunities um, in the region. So I think with that, um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your patience and I look forward to our discussion in the plenary. Thank you very much.